Hello everyone, how are you? Hope you're doing well today. My name's Carl. Welcome to this webinar about teaching speaking skills here on behalf of the TEFL Org. Who are the TEFL Org? We are a company that helps people to train up as TEFL teachers. That's English as a foreign language teacher. I'm one of the trainers um, that works for the TEFL Org. So if you do any practical courses here in Northern Ireland or the Republic of Ireland, you might be lucky enough to spend the weekend with me where I can teach you how to become an EFL teacher. Um, I myself have been lucky enough to have taught in many places around the world. I've taught in China, Vietnam, Azerbaijan, Sri Lanka, Kazakhstan, Iraq. Just before COVID, I was teaching and working a lot in Spain and Italy. Um, and now I work as an online teacher. I work as a teacher trainer and I work as an examiner for various different um, examination boards that exist in English as a foreign language. So hopefully today I'll be able to answer any questions you might have about teaching speaking skills or English as a foreign language itself. Um, please say hello in the chat and let us know where you are. I can already see some people saying hello. Daniela in Italy. Hello, how are you today? I was doing some examining in Italy virtually uh, last week. Uh, Rachel, hello in Colorado. Isaias, if I said that right, in Vietnam. I lived in Ho Chi Minh City for a while, Isaias. It's a great place. Uh, Ronald in England. Maria in London. Janice in Florida. Jeannie in Washington. Kathleen, Amer lots of American people in today. Uh, Inspiring Teach in New Jersey. Sarah in Wales. I can't keep up with one now. So look, hello everybody. Um, please, if you've got any questions at all, please put them in the chat and I will get round to answer them. The questions don't have to be about teaching speaking skills. They could be about anything at all to do with English as a foreign language. Uh, whether you're new to teaching, whether you want to get into teaching, anything like that, I can hopefully answer the question. If I can't, then Alan, who is monitoring the chat, will put in a link um, and he'll be able to direct you towards a website that um, can help you answer that one. And if you agree with me, please put it in the chat. If you disagree with me, please put that in the chat. We love a bit of debate here at the TEFL Org. So, teaching speaking skills. Right, the first thing I want to say um, is a little bit about, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what students want. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about different components of speaking. And then I'm going to sort of give some ideas of things you can do in the classroom to help you um, improve students speaking. Okay, so the first thing to make you aware of is you're going to get students come to you and they say, I want to improve my speaking. It has happened to me all around the world. Okay, so and it happens online as well. So this is definitely relevant to people that want to teach online as well. I get emails, I get Facebook messages saying I want to improve my speaking. And it's like, okay, very good. All right, well done. I, I can help you. <laughs> Give me some money, I'll help you. And um, it's just a really common statement for students to say, but what they don't really know what they need to improve, I think. Look, they probably mean pronunciation. That's probably the thing that they think most that they need to improve. When they say to you, I want to improve my speaking. And that's great. That's part of our job as a TEFL teacher to improve students pronunciation. And there's definitely ways that you can do that. I'll go into that into a bit. Um, the other thing that I hear a lot is I want to speak like a native speaker. They will say to me, oh, hi, I, I want to speak like a, a native speaker. And it's like, OK, great. OK, well, I can do that for you. It's pretty difficult to do that. I'll be honest with you, but we can definitely try and, and get you as high as we can. Um, with that. Now, the problem with that is, what does a native speaker sound like? So if they say, OK, I want to speak like a native speaker, do they want to speak like an American, a British, an Australian, an Irish, a Canadian? What is the native speaker that they want to sound like? Because we sound quite different in our accents and in the vocabulary we use. We use dialects, that kind of thing. So it's very difficult to make someone sound like a native speaker. What I tend to do if a student comes to me and says, I want to improve my speaking, I, I try and find out what their L1 English problems are. 
So every, if you go and work in Italy, the students are going to have different speaking problems from students in China. They're going to have different speaking problems from students from Indonesia. And what it tends to happen is that not actually an individual student has certain problems, but it's actually their L1, their Indonesian or their Arabic that has a sort of influence on their on learning English. So what you need to do is find out what typical problems, a speaking problems, a student from that country would have. And what the best thing to do is to just put into Google the language of the student you're going to speak, you're going to teach. So Italian, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, whatever it might be. Put that into Google, English speaking problems, and you will get lots of results. If it's a common language, such as Chinese, uh, such as Arabic, probably on the first page, you'll get some lines telling you that um, Chinese people have problems with this vowel sound. Arabic students have this problem with this consonant sound, whatever it might be. If it's a less common language, then you might need to go to something like Google Scholar. But I promise you there will be a website somewhere telling you for that language what their problems are. And once you've got that idea in your head, then you can work on how to teach and improve these problems that that language has. So that's the very first thing I would say if a student comes to you online or comes to you face to face and says, I want to improve my speaking. Likewise, if you're going to a job where you go work abroad, it's a really good idea to put into Google typical Chinese English speaker problems and see if you can talk a bit about that in the interview. That's something that the people would really, really like interviewing you. OK, so um, first thing is pronunciation, because that is tends to be what students want the most. They want to improve their pronunciation and you have to teach how to pronounce English words and English sounds well. OK, so. Uh, the first part of this I want to talk about is actually listening is a big part of speaking. And you've really got to get listening activities into your pronunciation classes. All the research that's been made by people with PhDs has, has sort of suggested this. OK, and if you look at textbooks, there's always a little bit of listening activities that go alongside the pronunciation activities. So don't just necessarily think in a pronunciation lesson that you're just going to be doing speaking. You've got to do a little bit of listening. And what that tends to come from is understanding something called minimal pairs. Now, it's a bit of a technical term, but um, it's basically the different. It's when a word sort of changes meaning by the, the way it's pronounced. And I'll give you some examples in a minute of this. And. There's consonants, there's uh, and vowel sounds, and there's diphthongs as well, but let's concentrate on consonant and vowel sounds. Consonant tends to be the k, b, v, and then the vowel sounds are uh, e, r, ah, like that. That tends to be different. If you look on a phonemic chart, you'll be able to learn more about that. If you do one of our courses, we also teach you about that. Um, and here's some examples. Uh, so if you've got let, and you've got lit. There's a very difference in sound. Le, li, le, li. This is a minimal pair because everything else is the same except for the vowel sound in the middle. Same bit, bat, bit, bat, sheep, ship, sheep, ship. And there's hundreds and hundreds of other examples like that. And that, they're the vowel sound ones. These are the consonant sound ones. Loyal, royal. If you're going to Japan, that's a big one that you would need to try and fix. Uh, flight, fright, boat, vote. OK, so these are minimal pairs that you would need to fix. OK, and uh, what you need to do is raise students awareness of these different vowel sounds, because if they are aware through listening that they that there is a difference between the I and the e sound and the way it's spelt as well comes into this a bit. But you they listen and you put them in a sentence, maybe, or you just have different words where you you pronounce them and you have to say, OK, write down what you hear. And they listen. And go, OK, I think that was let. Eh, eh. So that's an E sound. OK, this one lit. OK, eh, eh, lit, something like that. You raise their awareness that these things exist in the world. And obviously, if 
if you've Googled their stu their typical problems, then you can um, uh, incorporate more of the uh, minimal pairs that that language would have an issue with. So you raise students when it's, and then you make them pronounce, uh, reproduce them. And there's different ways of doing that. You could um, model it yourself with your mouth. You could go online and um, look at the videos that show people where to move their mouth to make a specific sound and they have to copy them. Uh, you could do drilling. So you go through the class. OK, right. Let. Good. Let. No, no. Let. 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 Good. And then you go on to the next one. You go on to the next one. You do group. Then they work in pairs. They listen to them. They can do dictations, this kind of thing make them reproduce them like that and just make them aware of their own sounds that they are in English and how they are pronouncing them themselves. And as I said, these are often L1 specific. So they go with um, the problems that they might have themselves from their first language. OK, so that's like a typical pronunciation activity revolves around them. And then there are different activities that you can do. And I'll explain some of those a bit towards the end, different speaking activities you can do. Um, but they tend to be the first thing you need to do is to be aware of minimal um, pairs. Beyond that, you'd start looking at aspects of speaking such as sentence stress, such as word stress, uh, such as syllable stress, such as um, intonation and this kind of thing. That's another thing that you can do for pronunciation. So you could do a lesson on how to go up and down because a lot of languages don't do that. Um, which uh, syllable to stress when you're talking in a sentence because that's a big part of speaking English. So these are the sort of activities that you could do. And again, you would start that with a listening activity. They listen for the stress. They listen for the intonation. Then they reproduce it themselves. OK. Please, thank you for all the hellos. I love them. We've got people from Malawi, people from Georgia, uh, uh, Basque Country, Hong Kong, um, Florida, Oldham. <laughs> Not quite as exotic. Sorry, Carol. Um, Norway, uh, Nigeria. We've got loads of people. Please, if you've got any questions at all, please put them in the chat. OK, um, and just let us know uh, if you've got any questions about speaking English or any questions about getting into TEFL. We are here to answer them for you. I'll get to the questions in a bit. So let's now talk about another aspect of speaking, which is fluency. And um, what fluency, no, look, fluency does incorporate a few different things. But for me, the most important thing about fluency is that you stay on topic. That is the most important thing. Quite often with students that come to me, they they tend to just want to speak and speak and speak and speak and speak. And they're happy to just keep speaking. And, they, you know, they think they're doing really well in English because what they're doing is really, really speaking. And actually, you know, if I just keep speaking, then that'll be good. Then I won't need to do anything else because if I just keep on talking and talking and talking, uh, you know, that that was that's what um it would. That's what it's all about. But that actually tends to mean that you go off topic and it's also not very natural in their own language. They probably won't just keep speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking. So you've got to try and get them to stay on topic. That's a big part of fluency. And it is not about speaking quickly. Quite often students say, I want to improve my fluency because I want to speak quickly. And OK, like, you know, you don't want people to speak too slowly definitely you don't want them to speak too slowly because you lose the way you're talking if you do that but also it's not about speaking too quickly because if you speak too quickly that becomes quite difficult for people to understand and then again you sort of lose the fluency as I said about earlier so fluency is actually speaking at a natural pace it's not you know you, you don't want if students are speaking too quickly, you don't really want to stop it. But if it's too quickly for them to understand and they get ahead of their, their brain, then that's bad. But if a student is speaking too slowly, then you do need to fix that a bit. And also a big part of speaking fluently is not repeating yourself. If you've got a student that sort of says the same idea two or three different ways, then that is an issue. You've got to get them to just sort of 
give their idea, then elaborate on it a bit, maybe give some examples, that kind of thing, but don't go too far with repeating yourself again and again and again. How do we do this? So one of the important ways is if somebody is speaking, you, you, you get either in pairs, you get them to listen and take notes about what the topic is. Or if you want to model it, you can give a little bit of a talk and you could just get them to write down some key words and make sure that they understand that you're not um, uh, going too far off topic, that you're not repeating yourself over and over again. And that's the natural way to speak. So by listening and taking notes, okay? And try and model good and bad behavior for fluency. So, you know, look at, a, find either, you could make it yourself, or find something online on like a, a TED talk or a YouTube clip where, and I'm sure if you put into um, Google bad fluency examples, you'll see loads. And just listen to a, somebody talking about a topic. So I would really like pizza tonight for dinner. Pizza is fantastic. It's one of my favorite foods. I really enjoy it when the pizza delivery guy comes and the pizza delivery guy, uh, brings it brings it in his car he's got a really nice car he's got a Vauxhall f f uh, Vectra and this Vauxhall car has four-wheel drive and actually I really like four-wheel drive cars four-wheel drive cars are the best cars that I've ever had and I would like to in the future buy a four-wheel drive car starting at pizza you end up going all the way off to a car you're not staying on topic so model a bad way of doing this and get them to take notes about this okay where does the speaker start? Where does the speaker finish? Is this natural? Is this good? Okay, modeling that kind of thing is good. Then model a good speaker. Uh, yeah, I really like pizza. Uh, my favorite pizza is pepperoni pizza. I do like the takeaway brand Domino's. Um, that's actually my favorite uh, type of pizza that you can get. And actually I'm gonna have a Domino's pizza tonight and I'll get it delivered. Fine, stop. Don't be afraid to stop them, okay? Show that it's a good speaker. And if somebody has bad fluency because they're going off topic or they're speaking too much or they're speaking too quickly, it can often be rectified, it can often be cured by reducing the length or the speed they talk at. I mean, I've met many students down, down the years and when you ask them a question, they sort of go, <gasps> blah, 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 blah. And that's not natural, that's not normal. So if you just sort of say, okay, you know, just right, this is some of the, the structure that I want you to keep, where you talk about this, you take the last idea, you add a bit more, you add a bit more a couple of times, then you stop. That is obviously a good way of rectifying fluency, okay? Thank you for the questions, guys. I can really see them. We're gonna come to those in a minute, I promise you. So then we've got grammar. Um, so there's two parts of grammar and to be a good speaking sh uh, student or to be a good speaker of a language, you need to have the accuracy. So by that, I mean having the correct verb tenses generally, but it also is things like subject verb agreement. I am, he is, they are that. Um, but also having a good range of grammar. So not just speaking all the time in the present tense. If you speak all the time in the present tense, that's just pretty boring. Can you get in some conditionals, for example? Can you get some modal verbs in? Could the students be able to, um, if they're talking about the past, use the past continuous and the past simple? So just making, it's teaching the range and teaching the accuracy. So tends to speaking comes within a grammar lesson. I don't like ideally doing just a pure grammar lesson. I like to do like a speaking lesson with grammar in. Um, and the students don't really know that they're doing too much grammar. They just think that they're concentrating on their speaking. And um, when you're teaching it, teach one grammatical aspect at a time or one grammatical part at a time. So today we're going to do the past continuous. You might not tell them that. You might if that's how you want to go. I tend to not, but just if you're saying, right, today is the past continuous and you just do the past continuous. Don't try and do, right, today we're going to do the past continuous, the past perfect and the present perfect all at once. That's 
too much, you're going to confuse them. It's not good. And then you do speaking activities around it. And if they've got problems in this where they're, they're having problems with their verb tenses and they're having problems with their plurals and they're having problems with their modal verbs, just try and error correct one aspect at a time. Because if you correct them too much, they're going to lose their heart. They're going to lose their confidence and they might not come back to you again because they think that you're a harsh teacher. So just try and fix one thing at a time. And that should be the bit that you're teaching for that day. Something called a PPP lesson is a great way of teaching grammar. And also um, it's also a good way of uh, teaching speaking. If you come on one of our courses here at the TEFL Org, uh, we will teach you how to do one of these PPP lessons. If you spend a weekend with me on a practical course or one of our other great tutors, you will also uh, actually deliver a PPP lesson. Um, it's where you present the grammar, it's where you do something called controlled practice, and it's where you do something called free practice. And you can get a lot of speaking activities into the controlled practice and the free practice. OK. Um, good. Loving all these questions. I'm seeing them coming in at the corner of my screen now. I'm just going to get to them. I promise you in a minute. Let's talk about vocabulary now. Um, again, accuracy and range. So making sure that the, the word is accurate for the situation that they're talking in. Also the word form. So I am very happiness today would be bad accuracy. Um, range. So that's a different uh, uh, lots of different words. So for happy, you could say ecstatic, over the moon, delighted. These kind of things add to the range instead of just saying happy all the time. So what you a big aspect of what you would teach is planning the topics. So you say, right, OK, today we're going to do a lesson on clothes. Then we're going to do a lesson on feelings. Then the next week we do a lesson on um, countries, whatever it might be. OK. And textbooks tend to help you with this uh, or a syllabus will help you with this. But also a big part of teaching vocabulary is formality. Teaching students when to speak uh, in a formal tone and use formal words. And you would actually teach these formal phrases and you would get them into your speaking by giving them an activity such as a role play. Today you are a businessman. You're meeting someone for the first time. Which of these phrases do you think would be very good? OK. Uh, for this situation and you know it could it could be little things like greetings uh, all right uh, hello good morning good afternoon you know which of these is best for this situation oh I don't think all right sounds correct no exactly you know and then they would get them speaking doing role plays brainstorm with students what vocabulary do they know for that topic so today we're going to do uh, food uh, describing food what uh, fra work with your partner. What phrases do you know? Uh, OK, uh, delicious, um, uh, good value, salty, sweet. Yes, good. Right. Get them in. Write them down. Good. In a minute, you're going to do a speaking activity and then you might add a few more that you found yourself. Do some vocabulary lessons around that. OK, today we're going to just talk to each other. Uh, these questions. What's what food is famous from your country? Uh, what food do you like from your country? What food do you not like from your country? That kind of thing. All right. Um, again, sort of a raising awareness of their vocabulary. So are they are they repeating things a lot? Uh, are they not being accurate? Make them aware of the phrases that are coming out of their mouth by recording themselves and then having to do notes or talking to a partner and then having to write down the words like that. And then you can use something called a thesaurus. Uh, Google has a thesaurus built into it. Uh, there are books, uh, specific books called a thesaurus, which is a bit like a dictionary, but what it does is it gives you extra words. So if they are always using the word happy, you can say to them, OK, look, just I've noticed that you've said happy four times in that minute. Can you think of any other words? No, I don't know any other words for happy. OK, well, here, I look online, go to this Google thesaurus and type in happy. Oh, wait there. It says delighted. Can I say delighted, teacher? Yes, you can. Uh, can I say um, over the moon? Yes, you can. Great. Right now, let's try it again. Try and use these phrases, get them working on doing this kind of thing. Then some sort of specialized skills. So the main sort of big ones that you'll get are like the grammar, the vocabulary, like I just said, pronunciation. But 
think about situations that you yourself speak in, okay? And you might need to teach students to be in that specific situation. So when they come to you and say, I want to improve my speaking, the next question is, what type of speaking? Oh, I don't know. Okay, so that's just general English. Oh, I'm going to university. Ah, okay, so I'm going to teach you speaking skills for university. Oh, I'm going to sell my product at a trade fair. Okay, I'm going to teach you business English speaking skills. And think yourself, how would you speak in a business meeting? Probably different from how you would talk in other situations. You tend to be a bit more formal. You tend to probably hopefully listen maybe a bit more. Um, you tend to have specific vocabulary you need to talk and hear for in these ones, okay? How do you talk with friends? You speak very differently with your friends than you would in a business meeting. And it's a different level of formality. And if a student says, actually, I want to go to uh, university and make friends, great, let me help you with some chat about uh, some phrases that you could use to start conversations, that kind of thing, to be friends. Doing a presentation might be quite similar to a business meeting, but a meeting, you know, you're maybe saying whether you agree or disagree. Presentation is you up there, you're probably looking for phrases like firstly, secondly, very formal grammar, nice speed and fluency to your pronunciation. This kind of thing you would be able to teach. Answering a phone, uh, on video calls, you know, this is a new skill that we've all got to learn and actually it's quite a difficult skill to do in a second language, okay? What can you teach? So you can teach formality. That's, that's a really big part of teaching speaking. Writing as well, but definitely speaking. If you, if you ever have someone in your, who's learning your language and they, they say something that doesn't quite fit the situation and you're a bit, oh, well, well no, oh, no, we wouldn't say that. This could be formality, all right? Definitely set phrases. Answering the phone, there are, there are phrases that we need to say. Oh, hello, uh, this is Carl speaking, something like that. Or, oh, hello, uh, thank you for calling, something like that. These phrases that they can get in so they're prepared. And there's specific vocabulary for all of these as well. So what do you need to do? You need to make speaking fun. And these are some of the ways that you can make them fun. Uh, so for pronunciation, I think a nice little activity is something called whispers. And that's when you get students in two lines you say to the people at the back of the line a word, they then run to the next person, they say, okay, orange. And then the next person goes, orange. And the next person goes, orage. And then the next person goes, olage. And then it ends up, and they're talking about apples at the front, something like that, or something like that. But you can also be a sentence, it doesn't have to be individual words, okay. Uh, that might be something that you've played before. That's a good way of improving pronunciation, especially if you've got a big classroom, that's really useful. Can also do it online, believe it or not, um, by putting them into um, uh, uh, breakout rooms, okay? Uh, you can also do physical word sentence stress. So word stress is when you say a word in a sentence more clearly and you give it more volume than other words in a sentence. And there's loads of videos online showing you about English word sentence stress. Uh, and, um, and within a word also you can have different syllables. So happiness, we say the ness uh, with a little bit more stress. Happy, we say that with a, we don't say happy, we say happy. And that, um, you put the, the syllable stress on that part of the word. And one of the ways of doing this is you could line them up in a row you could say a sentence sort of say uh, my name is carl and you get them to sit down if the words aren't stressed we get them to stand up if the words are stressed you do the same within syllables that kind of thing for fluency uh just get them to speak more and just being able to, to talk and practice you could play a game called taboo that's where they have to describe a word and you can make it easy by just putting giving them a word bicycle they have to describe it to their friends without saying the word bicycle. Um, it's a transport. It has uh, two wheels. Um, uh, you use your legs. Uh, it can be on road or off road. To make it more difficult, you can say certain words that they're not allowed to say. So describe a bicycle without using the word wheels. 
describe a bicycle without using the word legs, for example, that kind of thing. You write it down on a piece of paper, they speak it out loud. Pictionary is also a good way of um, getting them to come up with words on a topic. So they draw something, okay, uh, it's a fr so they're trying to draw a banana, and you could go, uh, it's uh, it's the moon, uh, it's, fr uh, no, it's uh, no, an apple, it's an orange, oh, it's a strawberry, what is it, what is it? Get them to just use topics like that, thinking about it. Vocabulary tennis also helps them stay on topic with lifting their vocabulary level. Uh, that's where they have to sort of hit a ball to each other by saying sort of, Elephant, cow, dog, uh, sheep, something like that. Vocabulary tennis. Uh, guess the famous person. You put the name of someone on there. They have to describe someone. Uh, you can also, with a phonemic chart, you can do something called phonemic bingo. This is where you give them lots of words. Uh, and you have to say these words. And you might do different minimal pairs. And they have to listen to them and then cross off the words that they've done. Again, could be done online. And also just very simply talk about a topic for one minute. And they, you give them the topic education for high levels. They start talking about education. After a minute, are they still talking about education or have they gone off topic? It can also be done with grammar this and you say, okay, talk about a holiday last year that you did. They talk, talk, talk in the past tense. Ask your partners, what were all their tenses right? Did they use a range? This kind of thing. Thank you very much, everybody. If you're still with us, I really appreciate that. I hope that that has um, given you a bit of an insight in how to speak and teach uh, speaking skills. OK, I can see some questions coming in. Uh, let me see if I can just get the first one up, please. If you've got any more questions, do please put them in the chat. OK, uh, right. Uh, Teaching pronunciation can get very technical. How do we keep, how do we help students who are struggling if we don't have a ton of experience teaching? Um, let me just see if I can get that one up. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can, can I? Uh, no, I can't. Okay. Uh, let me, sorry, I'm just trying to, I'm just having a bit of a technical problem and I can't uh, get them the questions up to come up on the screen at the moment okay uh right let me just see okay first question is from uh okay uh let me see alan can you help me out can you just highlight a question uh there we go thank you uh word stress and sentence stress sorry thank you alan i was having a bit of a trouble there uh what does this mean um, OK, so word stress tends to be the syllables within a word. So I keep saying happiness. Let's keep using this one. Happiness. Three syllables in that. We don't say happiness. We say happiness and we pronounce different syllables with more strength. If you go on um, a dictionary online, usually it shows a little dash before the syllable that's stressed more. Uh, within a sentence, there are certain words we say more or we... So, for example, tonight I'm going to eat fish and chips. Uh, we say fish and chips. We don't pronounce the and so much. So that's the sort of stress within a sentence. OK, Ronald, I hope that answers your question. Again, if you do one of our courses, this is something that you're going to learn about. OK, uh, Otis, hello. Is there a restricted age limit in TEFL for teaching abroad? Uh, yes, is the short answer. And also no is another answer. So basically it depends on the country. Um, so they tend to have certain countries that have visa, upper age visa limits. And these tend to go into the um, uh, sort of 60s. So it's not really the school saying you can't teach there. It's the government saying that you you can't get a visa. Countries that don't have this tend to be the European countries. Um, you know, if you want to TEFL in the UK, Australia, Canada as well, America tends to not be an upper age limit. But if you want to go work abroad, there can be. OK, so it does depend on the country you want to go. This tends to be people in tends to be sort of mid 60s. Otis. That tends to be the upper age limit in terms of getting a visa. Okay. 
Hope that answers your question. Let us know where you want to go, Otis. Uh, Maggie, hi. He did 180 hours TEFL. Uh, okay, right. So the first thing I would say to you, if you're scared of teaching online, is that the theory behind um, teaching online is the same as the theory teaching practically. So we're teaching face to face in the classroom. You have got to have um, lots of student talking time. You've got to have lots of pair work. Uh, you've got to have, you know, the same way you would teach a, a PPP lesson, for example. You still do skills lessons. What changes is how you deliver the activities. With kids, it can be, I think, a little bit more tricky because it, it can either be you speak into a room and the students are all there in the same room together and you are directing the students about, okay, run here, run there, or what can you see here? What can you see there? And you hold things up on the screen. So, But the theory is exactly the same. What you need to think, Maggie, is how best to get, um, how best to actually deliver them online through things like Zoom, through things like um, uh uh, Skype or whatever it might be. What I would suggest to you, Maggie, if you really want to get into teaching online, and I do believe that even though we've got, um, we, we're coming out of the pandemic, hopefully, I still believe there's going to be a big market for teaching online. Okay. If you go to our website and if you go to our TEFL courses uh, section, okay, there is um, if you tefl.org. We have a practical course. I'm just going to, I don't know if you can make that big, Alan, for me. Can you? Is it possible? Uh, let me just thank you. So if you go to our website, tefl.org, and you click on TEFL courses, we have special sections here. We have special courses that you can do, sort of add ons to the 180 hour course that you've done about how to teach online. You can also do a practical course. Uh, where you actually would teach online with someone like me. We would go through what you would do. OK, share your screen now. Stop this. OK, what can you do? A, could you do that in a shared document? Could you do that in the chat function? And once you've got that going uh, and you've done it a couple of times, Maggie, you'll be really keen and you'll be really good at it, I'm sure. OK, so don't worry too much. Everybody's got to start somewhere. All right. Uh, hello, Bev. Hello. Uh, you're a former primary school teacher in the UK and you'd love to move and teach English as a foreign language online. Good. What advice can you give me? Um, right. Well, the first thing I would say to you is, um, right, we've done webinars where I talk a lot about teaching online. So uh, there's different ways of getting into it. You could go and work for a company. That tends to be how most people start. And it's a very good way of starting. So if you go on one of on our website, tefl.org, if I'm, I'm guessing you've already got the TEFL certificate, Bev, you probably do need to do a TEFL certificate as well as your primary school PGCE thing. OK, if you go to the TEFL jobs section on our website, you'll see jobs on there advertised to teach online. So that's you go a company, let's say in Japan, is employing Bev in the UK to teach through Zoom to their students. They find the students, they sort out the payments, they pay you, this kind of thing, all right? The other way to do it is, and this is, I think, long-term the best way, is to find your own students. So that tends to be through getting your own website, doing your own marketing, doing your own advertising, this kind of thing, getting the students into you, and long-term you can tend to earn a bit more money than that, but that takes time and can be quite difficult. You've got to really be on it. You've really got to know your stuff in order to be good at getting the students in. But what I would say to you, Bev, is that probably the best way of doing it, if you want to be as an online teacher, is to start part time. Don't give up your primary school teaching straight away to become an online TEFL teacher. Can you do a bit of both? OK, can you just do it maybe one weekend, one afternoon? Could you start doing that uh, the online teaching that will probably just be enough to get you into it okay see if you like it you might like it you might not Bev okay uh, Pavan how are you uh, what is the best source of reference to improve the pronunciation of particularly from South Asia so are you, if you're looking for activities look, I've, I've, I've I'm not a an amazing teacher of South Asian students. It's not something where I've had a lot of them. Okay, I did. I, I mean, I did live in Sri Lanka a bit, but I was actually teaching quite high levels. What tends to be with 
South Asian students, they tend to be, the problems tend to be grammar. The problems tend to be they speak too quickly. And I can say this from being an examiner. If you, the first thing is making sure that they don't try and do every verb tense ing. That tends to be what, yes, yesterday I was waiting and I am now sitting and I'm doing, you know, they tend to like to put ing. Okay, so you've got to make them aware of that. Uh, then they tend to speak really, really quickly. You've got to try and stop them and really slow them down and say, okay, slow down, stay on course, get your fluency right, that kind of thing, Pavan. But I, what I would do is I'd type into Google uh, speaking activities. I wouldn't say South Asia. I'd say speaking activities, uh, India, Indian speakers, speakers. Uh, 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 Sinhalese speakers, whatever, because obviously there's lots of different languages. I'd probably go down that route. It tends to be South Asia. They're pretty good, the speakers. They just need the more accuracy in there. Okay. Janelle, you're in Barbados. That might win. I wish I was in Barbados. Uh, although the UK is getting some Barbados type weather this week. Oh, yes. Uh, Motu Narayu. I'm sorry if I pronounced that terribly. Is there particularly material to teach English as a foreign language? Oh, there's loads of different materials. Why? Because within, Eng within English as a foreign language, there's different types of English as a foreign language. There's academic English, medical English, business English, uh, general English. Within those, you've got levels, beginner, intermediate, advanced, and, and others in between. Each textbook would go for a different type of English, different level. And also there would be um, a kids uh, levels and kids age ranges in that as well. So there's lots of different material. What I would say to you, uh, Motunarayo, is that if you do your training, we will show you how to make your own materials. And that Look, there's there's two real ways of doing it is you can make your own materials that does take a while but once you've made them you can reuse them or the second way is to just go use a textbook and that tends to be the easiest way but can be a little bit boring and might not be exactly what your students need so the particular material really comes from the students and what they need and a few weeks ago i did a webinar on needs analysis might be worth going and have a look at that one all right Okay, good luck. Um, LinkedIn user, hello. Teaching pronunciation can get very technical. Yes. How do we help students who are struggling if we don't have a ton of experience teaching it without becoming without it becoming a niche? Interesting question. So, right, tends to be with pronunciation. Believe it or not, you can do one hour set pronunciations just on one uh, phonemic sound or just on one intonation for example aspect of speaking so you don't try and give it too much you don't try and right today we're going to do four or five different english sounds no you're just going to do one maybe two uh intonation you can also do fun things like as i said in the webinar at the end um things like taboo phonemic bingo this kind of thing is, is a fun activity so yes it might be a bit technical in terms of the correct mouth position what I wouldn't tell them is that is a, the important phrases like fricatives and nasal sounds and that kind of thing. I, you know, I wouldn't get down that route. I would, you know, just teach one sound, show them how to produce it, get them to do activities based around it and maybe some games. OK. Uh, I hope that answered your question, Mr. or Mrs. LinkedIn. We have another LinkedIn user. Uh, why? Hello. Thank you. I like that. That's nice uh, for sharing your insights. Uh, do I know of any L1 specific pronunciation issues to tackle for Eastern European speakers? Romanian. Uh, I don't have any <laughs> experience of teaching Eastern European speakers. I'm trying to think back. Have I had any Polish speakers? Not really. Right. L l I could make up something, but it would probably be wrong. LinkedIn user. So what I would do is put into Google. Uh, Romanian speakers of English problems, something like that. You'll find something somewhere. Somebody somewhere will have written a PhD about Romanian speakers problems in speaking English. I promise you. Somewhere out there on the big world wide web. Really didn't help you there LinkedIn user. Apologies. Sarah, hello. 
Uh, what sort of time frame is reasonable in which to expect someone to correct a specific L1 pronunciation? They might not ever. That's something that you've got to think of, Sarah. What your job is to make it less intrusive. And if this is a problem, which means people can't understand them, then it needs to be worked on and worked on and worked on and worked on and worked on until it's just not fossilized in their head anymore, that they've managed to just make themselves so aware that they're doing it, that they change it. However, if it's a problem which is just a little bit, you know, you can notice that this, they, they're not saying it properly, but you still understand what they're saying. I don't think you need to spend a huge amount of time on it, Sarah. People, it's really difficult for someone to speak a different language to a native level of perfect English. OK, and if you've just got to keep going at it, basically, you know, they can't they, they won't be able to get there quickly. They might never get there. OK, especially if they just came to the language as an adult. So just sort of think, Sarah, OK, they've got this problem, but actually 99% of the English speaking world would understand what they're saying. Is it a problem that you need to keep working on? If they really, really want to keep going at it until this problem has gone, I would sort of ask them why. What is the big, big issue for them? Why do they really want that? Because they might not need to. And it could take one lesson. It could take 10 lessons. OK, sorry, Sarah. Uh, that's that's what I can say. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, Jeannie, hello. You find it difficult to teach intonation to an international group of students. That's a good one. Yeah. So if you've got a, a mixed English, mixed nationality classes tend to be the best classes if you're lucky enough to do that. So that's when you've got a Portuguese person sitting next to a Chinese person, sitting next to a Polish person, sitting next to a Hungarian person, sitting next to a, a Brazilian person tend to have really lots of good ideas, loads of uh, good chat, this kind of thing. I'm not sure why necessarily it's harder to teach intonation in this group. The, 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 the problem is when you've got an in, the good things about an international group of students is the variety, the energy is really good. The problem can be that you might have a group of students where in, they, they use the same intonation as English. Oh, this is boring because we do this ourselves. Whereas you might have a group of from a different part of the world that don't do this and they are, oh, this is the most interesting lesson ever. What you need to do in that situation, I think, Jeannie, is get them to sort of teach each other a bit. You know, give their own examples, talking about their own language. Maybe even give them some, they give some examples of them doing it in their own language that they listen, that the other students listen for. OK, I, I think that's it. And also give some examples, Jeannie, of you change an intonation to change meaning. Um, oh, that sounds delicious is is quite nice. Oh, that sounds delicious. Doesn't sound good meaning. OK, that sounds like a bad meaning. So little things like that that can make it a bit more interesting, a bit more exciting. Jeannie. OK, uh, good luck. Uh, Janelle, uh, which process is more difficult teaching online? I don't think either of those are more difficult than the other. Right. I started as a face to face teacher. I now work online. I do some things face to face, but I majority of my life is spent in this office teaching online through this webcam. Um, and I like it. Yes, it can take some getting used to teaching online. If you you do have to have a couple of things, you've got to have a bit of technical knowledge in terms of where to click. I'm not talking about like computer programming talking about like sharing screens and sort of getting knowing where the chat is and how to deal with the problems that you might have and also the te the student might have. OK. The other thing that you've got to be a bit aware of is that it's going to go wrong online sometimes. And that's not a problem. If they lose the connection, what's going to happen? Don't be stressing if they lose the connection. If someone loses the connection, give them some information about what to do like okay right okay you're gonna go offline okay if it doesn't come back on after five minutes email me um connect me on whatsapp this kind of thing all right um you know just, just this kind of thing is 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 what you you need to give them. like something to help you once the technical issues go wrong okay 
I don't think I've it suits people some teach some people love teach speaking on teaching online some people like teaching face to face some like doing a bit of both I don't think one is more difficult than the other okay uh Dora hello what a lovely name Dora Dora the Explorer are there any funny academic topics for discussion my students feel fed up whenever we repeat the same topics in the high school it sounds boring well tends to be I'm not sure about funny academic topics Ooh. what tends to be is the best ones tend to be the controversial ones so you know if you're talking a bit like stereotypes uh what ages tend to be the best to do this you know this kind of thing i don't i would i don't think funny academic i'm trying to think off my head anything that's funny no what i would say dora is that you know if they feel bored can you change the types of activities you know get them doing debates get them doing presentations get them doing uh written work that kind of thing on the topic all right uh Having a range of activities can make the activity the, the topics seem a bit more interesting. You might be doing that, Dora. Okay, uh, but you know, getting like listening activities, getting reading activities, appealing to a wide range of different um, learning styles, that kind of thing can really make a change. Okay. Uh, good luck. Uh, we are coming to the end of this webinar in a few more minutes. Uh, then we'll be finishing uh nizar hello uh right materials or fixed guidelines so yeah there's plenty of materials out there again this is something that we would help you on our if you do one of our courses here at tefl.org tefl org uh guidelines i'm not quite sure what you mean by guidelines i mean there's theories behind teaching and you know this is the way to teach grammar this is the way to teach speaking and you know, you stay within those theories. You might just go outside a little bit as you get more experienced, but you stay within those theories and that's how you teach. And, and that's sort of like a guideline. This is the best way to teach grammar. This is the best way to teach vocabulary. But as you get more experience, you'll find different ways of doing it. Companies might have specific guidelines. They might have specific ways that they want you to teach. OK, fine. Um, you know, you have to stick with those if you're going to go work for a company. But the best companies out there give you a bit of freedom, Nizar. OK, I hope that helps you. OK, um, Doreen, my nan's called Doreen. Is there a formal way of assessing students to know what level they are? Yep, you need to do something called a placement test. Right, uh, I could talk for an hour about this. Um, placement tests tend to be uh, when you first meet a student and you want to know what level they are and they and a fantastic good placement test would be a writing test, a reading test, a listening test and a speaking test. That can be difficult. What you tend to do is a writing and a speaking one. You test their productive activities. However, if they're coming to you to do reading activities, you want to test their reading ability. So you, it could start by asking them questions and they keep moving up. So you start with simple questions. What's your favourite food? Uh, what food is cooked in your country? Uh, if you had to cook tonight, what would you cook? And you keep you, you sort of add on little bits like this till you sort of maybe change topics and you end up with what is the number one political problem in your country right now? If they could keep going and keep going through all of these levels as they get more difficult, then they're a higher level. If they struggle at the start, then they're low levels. If you put into Google, Doreen, uh, EFL or ESL placement tests, you'll find a few on there. OK um thank you everybody uh last question i think this is uh new generation channel might have to try the new generation channel what is a suitable activity for young learners to encourage them to start speaking so don't expect too much you get with young learners you get shy people you get uh outgoing people it's normal okay by young learners i'm going to guess sort of eight years old all right basically it, it's it's if they're if they're low levels it's enough just for them to get speaking individual words if they are more advanced and you've just got to get them talking about things that they like talking about get them talking about toys get them talking about music get them talking about their mum their dad hopefully they like their mum and dad uh, get them talking about their dog their pets get them speaking about things that they like themselves things that are important to them okay and just be aware, 
that they probably won't be able to speak for very long on it. So you might need to ask loads and loads and loads of questions and really, really getting out of them the one word answers. Don't get them doing this at all. Get them speaking in sentences. What's your favorite food? Pizza. Oh, teacher, my favorite food is pizza. I like pepperoni pizza. Just getting them to add a bit more information each time. Okay. Don't expect too much from young learners in speaking. Think about your own young people in your own country. You know, what sort of topics do they like learning about at the age of eight? That's the sort of topics that you can use in an EFL or an ESL um, classroom. Okay. Thank you, everybody. If anybody is still there. Oh, they are. People are still there. Lovely. Lots of thanks coming in. Uh, Dora, no problem. Otis, thank you. Your awesome biz coach. Some amazing names today. Thank you for the advice. Uh, Katrina, Doreen again. Hello. Thank you, everybody. Please, if you want to become an English as a foreign language speaker, we can, teacher, we can help you. Go to our website, tefl.org. Or send us a message here on YouTube. By You can type in the comments underneath. Facebook, send us a message. LinkedIn, you can send us a message. You can go to our website. In the bottom right corner, we have a chat with us function. Um, please like this video. Please um, say if you enjoyed it. If you didn't enjoy it, also put that as well because it's good to get feedback. It's a big part of being uh, a teacher is getting feedback. Thank you for joining us this uh, Thursday afternoon UK time.